Hello, my name is Christopher Runstrom. I'm the creator of RulingPlanets.com, and I want to welcome you to Christopher Renstrom Astrology. This week, I wanted to talk to you about the horoscope of one of my favorite painters, Vincent van Gogh. When I was 10 years old, my mom took me to the Vincent van Gogh exhibit at the M. H. D. Young Memorial Museum in San Francisco, California. She was so excited about going to this exhibit. She said to me, this is a touring exhibit, which meant that it was touring maybe about two or three other museums at the time. And she wanted me to go see it with her because Vincent van Gogh was one of her favorite artists. And she thought that I would enjoy it as well. And I did. I fell in love with the sunflowers, the orchards, the irises, the boats on the beach, and Gauguin's chair. I was drawn to the story of an artist suffering for his art. What 10-year-old could possibly resist? She told me about how he had been penniless throughout his career as an artist and had cut off his ear in a moment of pique and had taken his own life and that he never knew that he was going to be the famous artist that he was. It was only after he had passed away that his art had become world famous and that Vincent van Gogh was a name that everyone on this planet was familiar with. Oh, that spoke to me as a kid. When you're 10 years old, you're feeling kind of misunderstood and creative and sensitive. So this idea, this idea of suffering for your art and that you would create this body of work and leave it behind, it was so romantic and it was so appealing and it fit perfectly with my 10-year-old oversensitive self. But the reality, the reality was different. The reality was Vincent van Gogh suffering. And then there was the art. There were two Vincent van Goghs. And one might say, yes, of course there were two Vincent van Goghs. One was the artist and one was the madman. But no, really, there were two Vincent van Goghs. The first Vincent van Gogh was stillborn on March 30th, 1852, and he was named Vincent after his father's father. The entry next to his name in the registry said Levenlos, which is Dutch for lifeless. One year later, and to the exact day on March 30th, 1853, Vincent van Gogh, the painter, was born. He was born at 11 a.m., in Zundert, Netherlands. So Vincent van Gogh, the painter, had an airy sun, a moon in Sagittarius, and Cancer rising. When we look at Vincent van Gogh's chart, we see that there are remarkable elements right off the bat. First of all, the majority of his planets are rising above the horizon and are actually approaching the 12 o'clock noon point of the chart itself. These are called elevated planets, and elevated planets have a particular power in an astrological horoscope. What we also see when we look a little closer is that the sun is exalted in the zodiac sign of Aries. Exaltation refers to a planetary dignity. What it basically means is that there are certain zodiac signs where the planets are more powerful or less powerful based specifically on the zodiac sign that they are in. The sun is exalted in the zodiac sign of Aries, meaning most celebrated. This makes perfect sense when you remember that Aries is the zodiac sign of the spring equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. And so the sun in Aries marks the start of the agricultural year. This is a young sun. It's not as heated as it becomes when it reaches the zodiac sign of Leo, which is in the heart of summer. So this young sun is seen as fresh, it's seen as bold, it's seen as pioneering. It's urgent to get out of the starting gate and to get its life up and going. So the sun is exalted in the zodiac sign of Aries because this is all about fresh beginnings and a heroic heart. The next planet that we would look at is Venus. Venus is very high up in the chart. It's almost at the 12 o'clock point if you look at the horoscope. Venus is in the zodiac sign of Pisces. 
Venus in Pisces is said to be exalted, meaning most celebrated. So we have the sun, which is exalted in the zodiac sign of Aries, and we have Venus, the planet of love and beauty and art and culture, exalted in the zodiac sign of Pisces, almost at the very top of the astrological chart. Next to Venus, almost exactly conjunct the 12 noon placement of the chart, which is called the midheaven. I want you to think of the chart kind of like a clock. It's designed like a clock. So the, you've got the northernmost point, which we call the midheaven. And an easy visual reference is to think of a clock, the, the noon point. Okay, that's the highest point of the chart. The highest point of the chart, we see the planet Mars in the zodiac sign of Pisces. Mars is not exalted in the zodiac sign of Pisces, but Mars is Vincent van Gogh's ruling planet. The way that I work with the ruling planet is that the ruling planet is the planet that rules the sun sign that you were born under. Different astrologers have different ideas about this. Some people say the ruling planet is the ruler of the ascendant. Some say the ruling planet is the final dispositor. In the way that I practice astrology, I regard the ruling planet as the planet that rules the sun sign. So Mars, named after the Roman god of war and combat, is the planet that rules Aries. And when you look at this chart, you will see that Mars is conjunct the midheaven. This means Mars is the most elevated planet in the chart. So not only is Mars Vincent van Gogh's ruling planet, but Mars is conjunct the midheaven, making it the most elevated, the highest planet in the sky of Vincent van Gogh's chart. So here we have Vincent, born under an exalted sun in Aries. This is a heroic sun, and it talks about a rugged individualist. It speaks to urgency in the person's life. People born under the zodiac sign of Aries never want to show weakness. In fact, they have a very hard time with weakness. People born under this sign are the ones most likely to say, get over it, or if they've been hurt in some way, to laugh it off and say it's no big deal. People born under Aries are heroic in the regard that they come to the rescue of other people. So friends and loved ones of people born under Aries know that they can call up an Aries at any time of day and the Aries will come on running and help them with whatever cr crisis or difficult situation that they're facing. So Aries is very much heroic. It's about rescuing people. Everything is done very urgent. It is the first sign of the Zodiac, which means it's out front. It's out in the lead, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a leader. If you're out front, if you're out in the lead, okay, you're first, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know where you're going. This is why Aries will respond to the urgency of the moment without really thinking of what the consequences of a decision or an action might be. Also, the idea of finding oneself is very strong with Aries. And this is an interesting thing to note. Aries is a fire sign. Aries, Leo, Sagittarius, these are all the fire signs. And the fire signs are associated to the idea of individuality and of self. With Leo, we have someone who knows who they are and they're quite comfortable with who they are and everyone else should be very comfortable with who they are as well. With Sagittarius, you have a fire sign that is drawn to higher purpose to spiritual pursuits or pilgrimages, looking for itself somewhere else in the world, somewhere other than where it was born. Sagittarius's motto is anywhere but here. Aries knows that somewhere in the future is themselves, okay? That they're in search of themselves. They don't really know who they are. And so they trust that somewhere along the lines in their life that they'll discover who they are. But again, because Aries never wants to show weakness, they never want to show confusion about who they are. They'll, they'll say immediately as a young child, I know who I am, you know, and it's almost said in a sort of challenging kind of way. But the fact of the matter is Aries grows into who they are. There is a youth that is always connected to the zodiac sign of Aries. When we look at the Venus in Pisces, the exalted Venus in Pisces at the top of the chart, we already know that Vincent van Gogh is a famous painter, and Venus 
being named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty, is a patroness of the arts. Okay, so Van Gogh is born with Venus very high in the sky. So we've got this artistic, creative spirit that's going on here, and we also have a passionate spirit, which is manifest in the zodiac sign of Aries. People born under Aries are often described as being passionate. It's a word that employers use for their employees when they get really excited about something or very forceful about something. They may say, oh, Bob, you seem to be really quite passionate about this project. And Bob might answer, yes, yes, I am passionate about this project. And, and so the employer will be like, yes, well, passion's a really good thing, Bob. And that's what they say as they sort of gradually make their way to the exit. Bob might be a little bit too passionate. Bob might be a little bit too much of a force of nature. And this is something that people born under Aries are very familiar with. But the word passion means suffering. And it comes from 16th century France, and it was used to describe the sufferings of Christ uh, from the period of the Last Supper through to Christ's crucifixion. So you'll have these passion plays that were performed in the Middle Ages, or they'll talk about the passion of Christ. And what they mean here is the suffering of Christ. So a Mars ruled sign, and you'll also see this in Aries' sibling sign, Scorpio, roars to life the more that it is beaten down. So a word that we want to think of, when we think of Aries, when we think of passion, when we think of the ruling planet Mars, the word we want to think of is struggle. And this isn't embrace the struggle, which can be kind of a self-improvement motto, you know, no pain, no gain, embrace the struggle. No. When you have Mars this powerful in your chart, the word is struggle. You are struggling. An exalted Venus in Pisces, as I mentioned, is always connected to art and creativity. But Venus is also an attractor in an astrological chart. She will describe the people that you attract or draw into your life. So what you might draw into your life, if you have a Venus in Pisces that's elevated, might be people from other cultures, people from other lands and countries, people from the wrong side of the tracks. These might be lost souls or emotional wrecks. People who feel like you're their last chance, and you may feel like you are the only one who can save them from themselves or from a disastrous life. And this is something that shows up a lot in Vincent van Gogh's relationships. Vincent van Gogh drew people into his life who were suffering or who were misbegotten or who were very troubled. And perhaps he saw in their sufferings companionship, camaraderie, an understanding of the suffering that he himself was experiencing. And finally, what does it mean to have Mars in Pisces conjunct the midheaven? Mars in Pisces is what I often call a constant craving Mars. It's full of longing and of yearning. It falls in love with faraway places, with unattainable people. It falls in love with people who might not even return their love and affection. And the strange way that this is all put together is that Mars is most active when it is yearning and longing. Okay, when it is fighting or struggling for something, but with the Mars and Pisces, when they realize what they wanted, when the person says yes, or they get what they wanted, this achievement often leaves people with a strong Mars and Pisces feeling disappointed, bewildered, and puzzled that all of a sudden they don't want what they wanted before. So this is why what I've seen happen in a lot of horoscopes with Mars and Pisces there can be an attraction to the things that they cannot have in life, whether it's a person or a situation or a goal or a never-ending pilgrimage or a never-ending contest. So this is one idea that I want you to keep in mind with the Mars and Pisces. But let's also remember the mystical side to Pisces, the connection to the invisible world, to the world of the divine, these qualities we often see in the zodiac sign of Pisces. And here we get the word martyr, which was a word that was often used with Vincent van Gogh. 
Martyr is another word with interesting origins. It comes from the Greek word witness, and it talked about Christians who were put on trial for refusing to participate in the state religious activities of Rome, which were a civic duty, by the way, that were imposed on all citizens, no matter what their religious bent. So this refusal to participate in the state religion and standing by and witnessing God, basically giving testimony to God, despite and, and the God that the Christians were talking about was the Christian God, the one supreme God, not one of the pagan gods or goddesses that were popular in Rome at the time, or even Caesar, who regarded himself as the divinity at the time. Christians refused to bend the knee, so to speak, and so they bore witness to the true God, the true divinity, and they bore witness to this divinity no matter the torture and they bore witness to this divinity even if they were put to death, which oftentimes they were. So being a martyr became the highest calling for any persecuted Christian. In the first three centuries of our era, to have been martyred was seen as an act of heroism, an act of glory. But martyr speaks to the conflict of being a criminal in the eyes of the state but faithful in the eyes of God. When you think of Pisces, we often see the two fish which are circling one another. When we look at the zodiac sign of Pisces, we might be put in mind of yin and yang, the symbol, the yin yang symbol, which looks very much like two fish that are following one another in a circle and is often invoked when people speak about Pisces. Pisces, the sign of the fish, also often reminds people of Christ the fishermen of men's souls, and the symbolism of the fish being associated to Jesus Christ himself. So this carries a lot of mystical associations, the zodiac sign of Pisces. And so the idea of martyring can be seen as Piscean. But being called a martyr, particularly in recent decades, has kind of come across as a bit of an insult. It's like, oh, don't be such a self-sacrificing martyr, you know, or you like to talk about your suffering because you like to talk about yourself. People often deride the word martyr because it talks about being a victim or talks about being long-suffering and maybe even getting joy or pleasure out of it. But this idea of martyr, of bearing witness to a higher authority, bearing witness to an invisible world. This is very much associated to Pisces. And I want you to think of the fish as being the dichotomy. All mutable signs represent a dichotomy or an admixture of different beings. Uh, Gemini is the twin, so it's two people. Uh, Virgo, particularly in antique star maps, you'll see a woman, but with wings on her back. Sagittarius is a centaur. It's got the torso of a fellow and the body of a horse. And Pisces, Pisces resembles Gemini in being the two figures that are circling one another. But in the psyche of Pisces, you have the mundane versus the divine. In the circle of Pisces, you have the sacred and profane. And with Mars in Pisces, you have agony and ecstasy. You have despair and you have rapture. These are things that are embodied in the zodiac sign of Pisces, and we can certainly attribute to the life of Vincent van Gogh. When we look at the ninth house, which is just to the side of the midheaven, and the ninth house is the house of what you believe, the ninth house is the house of foreign lands and foreign countries and long journeys, but the ninth house is basically a moral house. It's how you see God. There's a planet that describes the way you see God, which is Jupiter, and the ninth house is a house that's often associated to Jupiter, and it's the house of the divine. So here, when we see Neptune, the modern ruler of Pisces, in the ninth house, we begin to really appreciate and understand the mystical depth, the mystical vision of Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh was a mystic. He was a visionary. He definitely followed his own individual course in life. 
And what he wanted to do was to lose himself into that Neptunian mysticism. Um, what's interesting is that his family background embraced both God, the church, and artists. His father was a pastor, and uh, his father's relatives were art dealers. So Vincent was drawn to God and the church, and Vincent was drawn to art. But the attraction that Vincent had for the church was not something that was housed within a cathedral or the convention of scripture. When Vincent experienced the mysticism of the world, which is basically the world itself being a place that was divine and beautiful, it was with the wholeness of his being. It was a completely visceral experience. Now, if I may, I want to move on over to the Cancer Rising. Vincent van Gogh is a son in Aries with Cancer Rising. And so Cancer, we know, is a zodiac sign that's associated to home and hearth and roots, the roots of a family. It's the zodiac sign of the good mother. That doesn't mean that if you're born under Cancer that your mother was good, but it does mean that if you're born under Cancer, there's an expectation that mother and mothering and family should be good. And if you came from a difficult family or a background where you had trouble with your mother, you will make a point of creating that family and that security and that belonging despite what your background was. So with cancer being the rising sign, this is the face of Vincent van Gogh's chart, all right? So Vincent van Gogh may be and is a son in Aries dealing with a lot of struggle, which we talked about, but he would have come across to people as being very familiar, as being someone that people were comfortable around. Also, the rising sign to me is as important as the sun and the moon, not in the way that people perceive you, but in the way that you are in the world. All right. The rising sign is the face of the chart. It is the way that you express yourself. So with a cancer rising, Vincent van Gogh had a very strong attachment to his family. He loved his family dearly and with great depth and with great profundity. Unfortunately, the ruling planet of cancer is the moon. The moon is in the zodiac sign of Sagittarius. Sagittarius and cancer are not two signs that get each other. They don't really understand where the other one is coming from. A moon in Sagittarius is going to feel like my home is in another country. My home is with another culture. My home is somewhere else. And so you can get a lot of traveling with um, a moon in Sagittarius. And indeed, Vincent van Gogh spent a majority of his life traveling and living um, in other countries and other places and also coming back to his family on a regular basis. Now, Vincent van Gogh was born into an upper middle class family. As I said, his father was a minister and his father's relatives were involved in the art business. So Vincent didn't really have to go far away to find himself. He actually went into the family business, both family businesses, in unexpected ways. Now, what would be regarded as Vincent's most successful period, you know, in terms of Vincent showing that he was successful and, and, and a man of the world and, and an upstanding citizen, was probably when he worked in London as an art dealer in his early 20s. This is when he was making good money, he dressed the part of an art dealer, and he was very confident and he was very good with people. Either the planet Jupiter is strong or the, the two zodiac signs that rules Pisces and Sagittarius is strong. There's an ease with other people, and particularly an ease with other people from other lands and other cultures and other countries. So Vincent was very likable and charming in his early 20s when he was an art dealer and very much appeared and dressed the part. But unfortunately, his early 20s is when his mental health began to deteriorate. Vincent always uh, complained of melancholia throughout his life, of battling with depression and battling with despair. And uh, in his early 20s, 
uh, his mental health began to deteriorate quite dramatically. This is when he experienced what he called a calling, okay, a, a calling to leave his life and to go find himself somewhere else. And so he decided to follow in his father's footsteps by being a minister, and his father was very happy about that. His father was impressed that Vincent did things like translate the Bible into four languages all on his own. But at the same time, there was an obsessive quality to this. I mean, what young man in his, their 20s suddenly translates the Bible into four separate languages all on his own? And so there was a kind of fervor. There was a kind of passion. There was a kind of suffering that was associated with Vincent's calling. Vincent flunked out of theology school once, maybe even twice, I think, and was not making a success of himself as a minister. A minister has to minister to their flock and give sermons and care about the people in their church and also preach the scripture. Well, Vincent didn't want to do things the conventional way. He didn't feel like when he talked to people just in the pews in the church that he was really reaching the people. So what Vincent sought and obtained was a position as a missionary in Bornage, Belgium. And here he traveled and he went and he stayed with people that one wouldn't find in a typical Netherlands church. So the cancer rising gives Vincent a very strong feeling of family, strong fidelity to family. Vincent van Gogh sp spoke all the time of wanting to marry and have a family of his own. The moon, which is the ruler of cancer, goes to the long journeying tra world traveler, world citizen sign of Sagittarius. And we see that the moon in Sagittarius appears in Vincent van Gogh's sixth house, along with Jupiter, which is the planet that rules the zodiac sign of Sagittarius. This is fascinating because the sixth house in astrology, each house in astrology rules over an area of life. If you have planets in the 10th house, you're very identified or driven to realize your destiny, to improve your status, or to be the best that you can be at whatever your career is. If you have a strong rising sign or even planets in the rising sign, this is how you come across. It's how you approach something. It's how you go after something. It's what you really sort of stand for, you know, in interpersonal relationships. But if you're a Cancer rising, you know, you have a very familial air. And what happened to Vincent off and on during different times of his life is he was being invited to live in other people's houses and treated as a member of the family. So here, Vincent's moon is set in Sagittarius. His Jupiter, Jupiter is very much connected to how we experience God. Jupiter is in its own zodiac sign of Sagittarius. So Vincent van Gogh is very much drawn to the pursuit of his higher purpose and the realization of it. But both planets appear in the sixth house, which is the house of work, health, and service. This is seen as a lower house in a chart. So here we have these exalted planets at the top of his chart. But what's curious is that the ruler of his ascendant and the ruler of his midheaven, remember that the moon rules cancer, which is ascendant, Jupiter is the traditional ruler of Pisces, which is his midheaven, and Jupiter appears in the zodiac sign of Sagittarius, where it rules. So all of the planets really end up in the sixth house, which is the house of laboring, which is the house of service, which is the house of work. And so this is something that Vincent really leans into with his missionary work. He begins living in someone's house, but he decides that that's not where he should be living. This wouldn't be true to his missionary work. So he has a homeless person come and take his place in this house. And so people are like, what's this homeless person doing? And homeless person was like, I met this guy and he said I could stay here. And they're like, all right. Okay, so Vincent gives his bedroom to a homeless person and he goes and lives in um, a hovel. He goes and lives in a hut, uh, which has no flooring. And he basically wastes away. He doesn't eat. He doesn't bathe. He doesn't clothe himself. And this is something which becomes a recurring motif in his life. People who have their son in the sixth house very much administer to the ills of other people. They serve other people. They see themselves as being of service to. 
people who have their sons in the sixth house, regardless of zodiac signs, often identify with the underdog or the put upon person. And this is something that Vincent van Gogh felt a very strong solidarity with. So there's this pattern that starts in Vincent van Gogh's life, where he often ignored his health and his appearance, where he would go without eating. He would drink coffee and he would eat bread and that would be about it. And over a period of time, he would appear filthy. He didn't bathe. His clothes were ragged. And during those periods of time, his family would come looking for him or he would return to his household family and they would be horrified by his appearance and how he looked. And so they would immediately clean him up. They would buy him clothes. They would try to hold him together. But it was becoming more and more evident that Vincent was dealing with mental illness. And mental illness at this time in the 19th century, remember he's born in 1852, so this is probably the 1870s. This is pre-Freud. So <clears throat> people didn't really know about the unconscious or have any way of dealing with mental illness other than to shun the person or to institutionalize them. His family, like families today, who struggle with a loved one who suffers from mental illness were the same way. They were frustrated with him. They were despairing with him. His siblings got angry at Vincent for putting Mon Pa through this. How could you be so self-absorbed and evil and cruel to, to them? But the family members still reached out to him. They still cleaned him up. They still tried to help him to sort his life. And when he would come back, he would be mystified as to why they didn't understand his commitment to bringing the, the word of Christ to caring for those who were downtrodden. And Vincent van Gogh did care for people. He went and visited the sick. He went and visited the poor. He literally gave the shirt off his back a number of different times. But again, the question is, was he doing it out of belief or was he doing it out of mental illness. The two of them become very much combined um, and drawn together. But the sixth house speaks to his identification with the downtrodden, with workers, with those who are ignored by society, and he very much identifies to them, and his ministry. It would have been called, for instance, a street ministry in the 1960s or the 1970s, administering to people who are struggling. And in Vincent's experience, this was true Christianity. The sixth house is also interesting because it's a house of work, but because it's below the horizon and doesn't make the best relationship to the ascendant, this can be work that's not recognized, or this can be work that is never-ending. Uh, this is what we uh, realized when the essential workers during COVID, who were already hard-pressed in their jobs, then had to administer to COVID in the hospitals in which they went on full 24-7, and the work was endless. It was ceaseless. There was no ending. A lot of us, we can work on something, and we can have an accomplishment or something is realized. And even in medicine, you can heal someone or someone doesn't make it. But the sixth house can talk about service in which the service is ongoing. It never ends. You never reach really an end or a realization. So the sixth house can be seen as working in regards as an exercise in futility, or the sixth house can be seen as a work in progress. Both play very strong themes in the life of Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh saw his work as a religious person as without end. You just commit yourself to every single person who is in distress or who is in need of help. This also lent itself to his love life. But also when he discovers his career as a painter, it's ceaseless. The work is obsessive. It never ends. There's never a painting that he makes that says, aha, that's the painting. And it just continues. Now, I want to make a note here about mental illness. Vincent van Gogh did suffer from mental illness and what has been speculated to be psychotic episodes. An astrological chart cannot tell you whether you suffer from mental illness or not. But an astrological chart will illustrate the temperament of the person. What we have in Van Gogh's chart is a predominance in water and fire. 
And water and fire are two elements that are very much connected to low and high experiences. When you look at the elements of water and fire uh, on the elemental scale, water is the lowest because it talks about death. If you go to an ocean, you can see the waves, but you can't see the fish that are swimming beneath them. So water has always been associated to depth and to mystery, to emotions, memory, the unconscious dreams. And fire was always associated to the height. Fire was the highest of the four elements. It wasn't because fire signs are like the most evolved or anything like that. What the ancient astrologers were trying to describe was the height, the zenith of fire. They were talking about the stars in the night. And it comes from the Persian belief, an ancient Persian belief, that the stars in the heavens were the campfires of the gods, and that from these campfires spat out sparks, which were spirits that would descend down through the seven realms of the planets and enter the body at the time that it was born and animate the body. So you can have a soulful side, which is very deep and profound, which is water, Cancer Scorpio, Pisces. This talks about the heaviness, the soulfulness, soulfulness of these three signs. And then you can have the spirited or the excitable side of the fire signs, where they're very animated and they get very enthusiastic and, and very turned on about an idea and want to go and do things right away. We get our idea of spirited, meaning excitement, you know, from fire. And so fire signs are always trying to get back upstairs to the stars in the sky. And it was believed that when someone died, their spirit was released from their body and it flew up into the heavens and it returned to the stars. So when you have fire like Vincent has, and when you have water like Vincent has, the experience of ecstasy and depression, of despair and rapture, these go hand in hand. Now, some of you out there might be like, well, I don't have psychotic episodes, never, and I have a lot of fire and water in my chart. And right, okay, because you can't use a chart to diagnose that, but you may relate to the idea that you could have sudden highs and sudden lows, that when you're excited about something, it's like the best thing ever. And then when you're disappointed or it doesn't come through, you feel despairing and without direction. This is something that occurs a lot in charts that have fire and water in their horoscope. In 1880, when Vincent van Gogh is 27, his father threatens to have him institutionalized unless he cleans up his act. He's done with rescuing Vincent from these different hovels, watching Vincent become a burden on the family. He loves and feels for Vincent, but at the same time, he's a disciplinarian. He's Dutch, by the way, and he just wants Vincent to get it together, and Vincent isn't getting it together. And so he confronts him and he says, if you don't get it together, I'm going to make you a ward of the state. I'm going to have you institutionalized. And Vincent's brother, Teo, who's his closest brother and has taken over being an art dealer, he says to his brother, listen, you have to learn a trade. You cannot continue to be a heartbreak to mother and father. Why don't you learn to be a lithographer or a draftsman? You can get a job as an illustrator. And so Vincent feels betrayed, particularly by Teo, whom he confides a great deal in. And he feels ashamed, you know, with his father his father saying that he's going to institutionalize him. And in that period of time, Vincent decides to leave God and to commit himself to art full time. And that's exactly what he does. He builds himself. He teaches himself art. He buys himself books to teach himself drawing. He asks for prints from Teo. Remember, this is 1880, so there's no Instagram. There's no images. You're lucky if you could find an illustrated book. Teo gives him prints that he can look at. And Vincent teaches himself how to paint. He'd always had a talent, but now he's going to go about it absolutely to make himself, turn himself into an artist and to make money. Because up until this point, he's been financially supported really by his brother, Teo, who's been giving Vincent money and then giving his parents to give Vincent money. Vincent hasn't been able to make much of a living at all. And so instead of Bible quotes papering his walls, he's got prints and pictures and lithographs papering his walls instead. And indeed, for his solar return chart of that year of 27, it shows that Jupiter was conjunct Venus in Pisces at the top of his chart. Indeed, Jupiter, the ruler of Pisces, was at 29 degrees 
Pisces on his birthday at the top of his chart, and that is when he commits to becoming an artist. Something which is amazing when you think about the ruler of the ascendant, the moon, being in the sixth house, when you think about Jupiter, the ruler of the midheaven, being in the sixth house, if that Jupiter were in the tenth, that would have been fame. Okay, Vincent van Gogh establishing himself as famous in some sort of way. But because it's in the sixth house and it's under the horizon, there is a humility to this place. There is an emphasis on work and there is an emphasis on service. And what we often don't really appreciate about Vincent van Gogh is that Vincent van Gogh's art career begins when he's 27 and it lasts until his death at the age of 37. So Vincent van Gogh's art career was really only 10 years long. And in these 10 years where Vincent, you know, having lost God, finds art, uh, it's in this 10 years that Vincent van Gogh produces 850 oil paintings, along with 1,300 drawings, watercolors, and sketches. Yet for all of this output, this tremendous output, 850 oil paintings, 1,300 watercolors, sketches, and drawings, Vincent van Gogh in his lifetime only sold one painting. I want to share with you a quote from Vincent, which I think very much describes the sixth house, the process for him, his work. He says in a letter that he wrote to his brother Teo, life itself too is forever turning an infinitely vacant, dispiriting blank side towards man on which nothing appears any more than it does on a blank canvas. But no matter how vacant, no matter how vain, how dead life may appear to be, the man of faith, of energy, of warmth, who knows something, will not be put off so easily. And if that isn't an Aries work ethic speaking for itself in an astrological chart, I don't know what is. I now want to talk a little bit about Teo, Vincent van Gogh's brother. Because without Theo, there never would have been a Vincent van Gogh. Theo becomes an art dealer when Vincent fails at doing it. Theo's about maybe four or five years younger than his brother. And Theo's very much a man of the world. He's very grounded. He's very solid. Theo is a stellium in the zodiac sign of Taurus. But Theo also covers Vincent's bills. Theo covers Vincent's bills because he very much loves his brother. And he believes in his brother. As an artist, I don't know if Teo believed in his brother as an artist because he thought he was going to be a great artist. I think Teo believed in his brother as an artist because he figured art was a way that Vincent could get a handle on his mental illness, that he could get a grip on his despair, that he could find a creative outlet and possibly a job as an illustrator. Teo was always committed to this. And Teo had a very great love of art. Vincent had a love of art. And this was a love of art that the two brothers both shared. Theo appears in Vincent van Gogh's horoscope in two places. The first is as his sibling, his younger sibling. When we look for a sibling in an astrological chart, we often will look to the third house and we'll say, okay, this is our sibling. But actually, the third house usually describes your younger sibling. So Vincent, being the oldest of his family, Vincent would be his rising sign. That's where we would begin with Vincent, because three signs away from the rising sign is the house of sibling. And the way that you want to count is that you want to go rising sign, second house, third house. That's where you get the sibling. Now, the sibling that was younger than Vincent was his sister, Anna. And so Anna would be described as the third house in Vincent van Gogh's chart. The third house is ruled by Leo. Leo appears on the cusp in Placidus chart. And so Anna would appear as being very Leonine. And if you see a photograph of Anna, she looks very Leonine. And if you read about Anna's reaction to Vincent, it's very Leonine. She gets very annoyed with him on a number of different occasions and wants him to man up and get his act together. Okay, so to find Teo, if we find Anna at the sibling, 
sign. Okay, we go ascendant, second house, third house. To find Teo, we need to count three houses from the house of the sibling. Count third house, fourth house, fifth house. What you'll see, and it's an easy way to remember as you count siblings who are older and younger than yourself, it's an easy way to remember is that these houses sextile one another. So the third house sextiles the ascendant, and the fifth house, the fifth house sextiles the third. In the fifth house, we see the last degree of Libra and intercepted Scorpio in the fifth house. Let me break this down very quickly. The fifth house is the house of art and entertainment and sports. The fifth house is the house of delights, and it's the house of children. These are all ideas that are associated to the fifth house. When we look at the fifth house, you see a blank house. And I've had many people say, oh my goodness, this house is blank. What does that mean? I have nothing going on there? No. In astrology, you're always looking through rulerships, the network of rulerships. The planet that rules a house cusp, for instance, tells you where to look next to find that house, the meaning of that house. So when we look at Vincent's fifth house and we see 29 degrees Libra with the zodiac sign of Scorpio intercepted, and we see no planet there, so how can Vincent be an artist? Well, we have to remember that the ruler of the fifth house is Venus. Venus rules the zodiac sign of Libra. And if you look in Vincent's chart, you'll see that Venus is exalted in the zodiac sign of Pisces at the top of the chart. So that's where we're being told to look for the horoscope. Is Vincent van Gogh an artist? Well, we look at a fifth house and there is Libra on the cusp and Venus is exalted at the top of the chart. Chances are Vincent van Gogh's an artist. But what's also interesting is the intercepted sign. Scorpio in the Placidus system doesn't get a house cusp. And this is why I love Placidus so much. Scorpio doesn't get a fifth house cusp. So Scorpio doesn't get a street address in Vincent van Gogh's chart. I want you to think of an intercepted sign, a sign squeezed between two house cusps where it doesn't get a house cusp. I want you to think of an intercepted sign as an underpainting. It's not what you see on the surface, but it's what lurks underneath. So we see Libra, which is the ruler of the fifth house, and then Scorpio. Scorpio's traditional ruler is Mars. And where's Mars in Vincent van Gogh's chart? Mars is at the top of Vincent van Gogh's chart. It is the ruling planet of Vincent van Gogh's chart. And it's at, if we were looking at a clock, the 12 noon point. So this tells you how powerful art is for Vincent. It also tells you about his love affairs with prostitutes and unavailable women, but that's a whole different thing. But basically, it tells you about art, okay, and how important it is for Vincent. We also see Teo here, okay? It is in uh, the fifth house is the sibling who is younger than the younger sibling, okay? Vincent's the head of the family, so Teo's number three. Teo is born under the zodiac sign of Taurus. What is Taurus's ruling planet? Venus. All right. Where does Venus appear in Vincent van Gogh's chart? At the top of his chart. What is the zodiac sign that is intercepted in the fifth house? The zodiac sign that is intercepted in the fifth house is Scorpio. What is the traditional ruler of Scorpio? Mars. Where is Mars? Is at the top of the chart. Teo and Vincent are fused together. Teo is responsible for funding Vincent, who cannot pay for himself, and funding Vincent at a time when his family can't pay for him. And Teo is also responsible for Vincent's evolution as an artist. It begins with Teo saying, just teach yourself illustration. You know, don't go and live in shacks and, and give your money away to the homeless and become a homeless person yourself. Do something with yourself. Stop being a shame and, and an embarrassment and a tragedy to your family. He's not only that, but he's also the person who helps Vincent shape his vision as an artist. That's the first place that Teo appears in the chart, technically speaking, in the house of not the younger sibling, but the sibling who's younger than the younger sibling. The second place that Teo appears in the chart is he is born under the zodiac sign of Taurus. When you know someone's zodiac sign, 
use that sign and place it in your own horoscope to see how that person impacts you and interrelates with you. When we go and we look at Taurus, which we see intercepted in the 11th house, we find Teo. If the fifth house is the house of art, entertainment, sports, delights, children, all right, romance as well, the 11th house is the house of hopes, wishes, and friends. Now, the understanding of hopes and wishes and friends, and really what we need to understand is that it's friends in high places, okay? So these aren't just the friends you hang out with. These are the friends who might become your sponsor. These are the friends who might become your patron. These are the friends who are helping you to become a better person, who are introducing you to people that you need to know or advancing you or up the ladder, helping you climb the ladder of success. The 11th house is the house of patrons. How does that connect to hopes and wishes? The idea is that, and it's a very old Roman idea, <laughs> the idea is that the fulfillment of your hopes and wishes depends on your friends in high places. Teo not only funded Vincent, he's basically the funder of Vincent. Vincent doesn't make any money, so Teo pays Vincent to be an artist. Remember, Vincent never sells a painting, so Teo is paying for the paints. Teo is paying for the studios. Teo is paying for the prostitutes that Vincent ends up with and their families. So Teo has taken on the whole burden of, of Vincent. But Teo is also responsible for introducing Vincent to other painters and other artists, other painters and artists that Vincent didn't know. So Teo is helping Vincent to find his way. He's helping... Vincent to realize his hopes and wishes through his own context of friends in high places, and Teo himself is playing the role of patron in Vincent's life. And Vincent's letters are full of gratitude and shame to his brother, you know, that his brother has to pay for all of these things. But, and Vincent is always trying to like come up with a way of making that feasible. I'm paying for this because you wanted to be an artist and I'm trying to be an artist and so you should pay for it. I mean, sometimes Vincent is noble sounding and sometimes Vincent sounds like a 12 year old, but Vincent is keeping his covenant with Teo by producing art and he produces a lot of art. And unfortunately, a lot of that art goes unsold. Another way that Teo was influential in Vincent van Gogh's career is Teo introduced Vincent to color. Vincent, when he began painting, did it very much in the Dutch school. So it's very dark, somber, brown, black colors. Vincent really had an affinity for dark, black, and brown, and muddy sort of colors. And Teo was telling Vincent, there's, the, there's a modern way of painting right now. You know, you want to paint like a Renoir. You want to paint like a Monet. You want to paint like a Lautrec. Or, or do lithography like a Lautrec. Basically, it's, it's Impressionism in Paris. And so Teo was saying you want to paint like a Renoir, Degas, Gauguin, you know, someone with brighter, expressive colors. Vincent hasn't seen these paintings. <laughs> he just hears them described and he reads books of the color theories or whatever. It's not until Vincent moves to Paris and uh, becomes a roommate of Teo that he sees and socializes with these artists and he's blown away. I mean, he's blown away by the color and by the spectacle, but they're not him. They're not what he's about. And in the Parisian cafes, they get together and they, you know, theorize about art and do all these sorts of things. And, you know, this is the way that we're taking Japanese art influence and mixing it in with color and all these sorts of things, or there's pointillism. Vincent is like, this isn't speaking to the raw experience that Vincent wants it to speak to. And Vincent is always improving, you know, because he never sells a painting. He doesn't give up. It, and it's very Mars. It's very Aries. He, he brings himself back to always improving his work. And even when artists say to him, how, how can your work be so bad? Or you don't even know how to draw a figure and stuff like that. Vincent doesn't get defensive. Vincent simply says, yes, the figure may not be great, but I am teaching myself how to do this. 
And the only way that I can master this is by teaching myself how to do this. And it doesn't matter how many times I stumble, how many times I fall, how many times I fail. And if you really cared about me, you'd get behind me and encourage me like this. So as you can tell, Vincent wasn't the easiest friend and lots of friends, you know, people would come friendly to Vincent, but he could be in his moods and be uh, hurt by his words. Um, but nevertheless, he becomes part of the art scene in Paris. But Vincent doesn't like Paris. Vincent still doesn't bathe. Vincent still doesn't dress well. You know, Paris is how you show up and show yourself off. And, you know, you've got perfume and all these sorts of things. Vincent doesn't bathe. He works all day in a studio. He drinks a lot. He argues with Teo. Vincent's teeth are falling out. He smokes all the time. And Vincent doesn't like Paris. It's too artificial. And, he, and so he moves to Arles, which is outside of, it, it's far away from Paris. It's in the south of France, I believe. And there he sees the light, he sees the people, he sees the country. There's that sixth house talking again. You know, he sees the workers and uh, people just people. They're not peasants as an artifice. You know, they're not like noble men and noble ladies getting their portraits done. He sees real, honest to God, people. And that's why he's drawn to Arles and he's drawn to the color and the light. And of course, that's where he does some of his most famous paintings. Someone who joins him in Arles for a little bit because Vincent, you know, wants a friend and Teo knows that Vincent is really impossible to get along with. They tried being roommates. It was a complete disaster. And so Paul Gauguin is like looking for a place to hang his hat or whatever. And so Teo's like, go join Vincent down in Arles, <laughs> you know? And, and Gauguin's like, okay, I think I will. You know, I, I liked your brother and we got along. And so Gauguin moves down to Arles and they paint together. And they really enjoy this friendship. I think it was more on the side of Vincent than it was on Gauguin. Uh, Vincent was like, I have a friend, I have a friend. And, and Vincent had a sort of needy side to him where it's like, if you were his friend, you were the best friend ever. If you were the love of his life, you were the best love of his life ever. You know, if you were a subject for a portrait, you were the best subject of the portrait ever. You know, it's very Mars and Pisces, you know, the yearning, the longing, and also the infatuation, you know, that comes on in. And so they start getting along, and they paint together. They go out and paint together, and they get along until they don't. Vincent suffers from depression and really vicious outbreaks of temper, and it can come on suddenly and from out of nowhere. They're drinking one night, and Vincent all of a sudden gets up and throws a glass of absinthe over in Paul Gauguin's face. And, and he leaves, and Gauguin leaves, and Vincent immediately feels remorse and apologetic, and he follows Gauguin home, and he's just such a, you know, following Gauguin from room to room, or maybe it's stool to stool. <laughs> I don't think there were many rooms in this house. But, and so Gauguin's like, I'm just going to go out for a walk. And so Vincent stays at home, and then he becomes really anxious and really unsettled by the idea that Gauguin may never come back, and that he's le left, and he's leaving for good, and how could he leave him like this? I mean, Vincent would go into these real abandonment anxieties, and they were really quite severe. And so he races after Gauguin. Vincent confronts Gauguin with an open razor. So Gauguin's like, whoa, I'm so not into this. And he turns around and, and he goes to a hotel to the night and, and he stays there and Vincent begs him to come back to the house and Gauguin won't because he's got an open razor, you know. And so Vincent then goes home and he slices off his ear out of anger and out of despair. Things that mix together in that Mars and Pisces. Again, taken to an extreme degree because of Vincent's mental and psychic state. And so, um, and he slices off his ear. Many books have said it was just a lobe or whatever. No, he, uh, they recent, what recently surfaced at UC Berkeley was um, the doctor's notes and drawing. Vincent took off the entire ear. He goes to a brothel. Vincent would often go to brothels and frequent them when he was feeling lonely and depressed. He goes to a brothel. And he gives the ear to a cleaning girl. Her name's Gabby, and she's only about maybe 18 years old at the time. And he gives her this package that's wrapped up in newspaper. And he says, open it, you know, and she opens it and there's a bloody ear and she like freaks out. She completely flips out and she takes the ear to the police. The police go and find Vincent. It's a small village and he's very well liked here in this village. And they find Vincent unconscious on the floor and they take him to hospital because he's unconscious because either he's gone into a catatonic faint or, or it's loss of blood. 
It's not really clear. And he's taken to a hospital. They attempt to try to reattach the ear to his head, but too much time has passed, and that's just not going to be. And so Vincent recuperates in this hospital. And it's interesting because he's attended by a doctor, Dr. Felix Ray, who takes care of him. And Vincent often, because he had no money, as a show of gratitude, would paint a portrait. You know, and so he does one of Dr. Felix Ray, who doesn't like it. His hair isn't red like that. The colors are sort of mad looking. And he actually, you know, I, I think Dr. Ray goes and uses the portrait as a partition on a chicken coop for a number of years. In any case, the portrait of Dr. Ray is rescued. It's salvaged. And right now it's at the Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts. And its estimated worth is $50 million. <laughs> which is staggering. But Vincent doesn't know any of this. He drew a portrait out of gratitude, gave it to this doctor. His doctor didn't even know what he was looking at. And who knew that it was going to end up being $50 million? In any case, popular literature about Vincent Van Gogh says that the town sort of rose against him and said he was mad and crazy and signed a petition and insisted that he be institutionalized. In reality, the town very much loved Vincent Van Gogh. The people who signed the petition, I think like almost all of them didn't even live in the town and they were all friends of the landlord who owned this yellow house that Vincent and Gauguin lived in. And this landlord wanted the crazy guy out of his house with the bloody ear. And so he got a bunch of friends and friends of friends together and they signed this petition. But the town was kind of very proud of Vincent. They had all sat for him and they loved him dearly. But nevertheless, Vincent realized that things had gotten too dark. And so Vincent voluntarily confines himself at the Saint Paul de Mosellet Asylum, which is basically a mental institution after this incident with the ear. And here I want to move to the last part of the chart that I want to talk about. And this is Vincent van Gogh's North Node in the 12th house. It is a North Node in the astrological sign of Gemini. And it appears at 22 degrees Gemini in the 12th house. Now, the 12th house in astrology, we have a house of hopes and wishes and friends of in high places. We have a house of art, entertainment, sports, delights, children. We also have a house that's a very dark house, and that is the 12th house. And this is the house of self-undoing. Um, this is a house of self-sabotage. This is a house of self-harm. The 12th house was famously, until recent decades, associated to asylums. That could be a mental asylum, and it was also associated to hospitals. So certainly a mental asylum, a lunatic asylum, or a hospital. A lunatic asylum is how they were referred to in the 19th century, where people were basically interred. Even at a hospital, when you're checked in at a hospital, you can't just check yourself out whenever you want to. You're kind of interred. So the 12th house was associated to uh, mental asylums, hospitals, and prisons, a uh, place where you were kept. Uh, a modern-day equivalent to a 12th house would be a rehab center, okay, where you go and you're put into a rehabilitation center to work out, the to exercise yourself, basically, of the alcoholism or the drug addiction and then be reintroduced to society when you're in a place of health and stability, or at least that's the model, that's the idea. The 12th house was also a house of retreat, where you retreated to. So the 12th house was associated to convents and monasteries, and nowadays a 12th house would be associated to an ashram. Okay, so it's where you retreat. So you either can be institutionalized in 12th house for your, for your own good, or you retreat from the world to a 12th house place to cure your soul or to live a more pious type of life. So on May 8th, 1889, Vincent van Gogh commits himself to the St. Paul de Mosellet Asylum. Okay, he's basically putting himself in a mental institute. What's interesting about this is that the St. Paul Asylum was originally an Augustine monastery built in the 12th century before it was converted into a mental asylum in the 19th century. So you get both themes of the 12th house coming here. But Vincent really loved the quality of light around this area. It was in Saint-Marie-de-Provence. Uh, he loved the beauty of the landscapes. 
and he found welcoming the serene and understanding atmosphere among the nuns and the nurses who attended to him. So this is where he goes and he stays in this 12th house environment, in this insane asylum that was once a monastery. And this is where he also paints 143 paintings and more than 100 drawings in the space of 53 weeks. That's one year plus one week. And the paintings are some of the most well-known paintings of Vincent van Gogh. Here in this asylum, he paints the irises. He paints the wheat field with cypress. He paints a wheat field with a reaper. He paints vase with irises. And he also paints the famous Vincent's room in Arles. But the ultimate painting that he does here, the one he's the most famous for, is Starry Night. So here we have Vincent living out the 12th house in his chart, in his life. And we see in the 12th house, the North Node. The North Node is basically where you are going in life, and the South Node is where you have been. So the North Node is about moving forward in your life. It's where you're moving forward in this life and maybe moving forward in future incarnations. And the South Node is where you have been in life and might refer to previous incarnations. So on one level, one could say, oh, Vincent van Gogh has a North Node in Gemini in the 12th house. This shows that he was fated or going to become someone who would reside in a hospital or a lunatic asylum or commit self-harm. So that's one way of reading it. But I want to suggest another way of reading it, moving away from the idea of the mental asylum and moving more towards the monastic origins of the 12th house. There's a wonderful video that uh, the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson posted on his Instagram account at StarTalk. And he talks about how Vincent van Gogh is one of his favorite painters. And one of his favorite paintings, in fact, is Starry Night. And what he does is this marvelous breakdown of Starry Night um, and, and he says in this video, look at the crescent moon in the upper right. And then there's a bright starry looking object right there in the middle of the painting of Starry Night. Now, he says to the viewer, no one would draw a star that way because stars don't look like that at night. They're not that bright. The only object that would come across that bright in the nighttime sky is the planet Venus. Well, we can look to see where Venus was relative to the crescent moon. And so what he's trying to do is date and time the painting according to Venus rising uh, with that particular crescent moon and the time that Vincent van Gogh was at um, the St. Paul Asylum. When you do that, that phase of the moon and that location of Venus and that angle to the horizon which is depicted in this painting, you arrive at the conclusion that this was painted in the early morning hours or a depiction of the early morning hours of June 21st, 1889. And these stars in the sky are what Vincent van Gogh would have been looking at. And so he ends the segment by saying, well, that was fun to do. Um, but more Importantly, what he wants to communicate is the value of representation, that he is drawn to this painting because he's drawn to the way that other people see and perceive reality. We all know that the sky didn't look like that spatially, but in the vision of Vincent van Gogh, you know, with its swirls and with its orbs and its landscape, this is what the sky looked like to him. Or as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, it's what the sky felt like to him. So what I wanted to do is look up this time and date and place that Neil deGrasse Tyson has given me as an astrologer, and I wanted to cast a horoscope for it. And so 
what I decided to go with, I mean, uh, DeGrasse Tyson says it's in the early morning hours of June 21st, 1889. So what I wanted to go with was Venus was rising at 2 or just before 2 in the morning, but it's at 2.30 a.m. that Venus is really above the horizon as she appears in the nighttime sky. And so I couldn't find Sun Remy, France, in my astrology software, but I know it's about 12 miles away from Arles. And so I cast the horoscope for them. So when we look at the horoscope for Starry Night, cast for June 21st, 1889, at 2.30 in the morning, the moon, the crescent moon, is at nine degrees Aries. And what I found fascinating about that is that the crescent moon at nine degrees Aries is exactly conjunct Vincent van Gogh's sun at nine degrees Aries. One of the most powerful aspects or interchart aspects that you can have is a sun-moon conjunction. So here we see the crescent moon for starry night at nine degrees Aries exactly conjunct Vincent's sun at nine degrees Aries. What we can also see is that Venus, rising over the horizon, is at 15 degrees Taurus. She's in her own zodiac sign. So in Vincent van Gogh's chart, Venus is exalted in the zodiac sign of uh, Pisces, but she's in her own sign of Taurus at the time uh, of, of this painting or the depiction of the nighttime of this painting. Venus is at 15 degrees Taurus, and she is conjunct Saturn in Vincent van Gogh's chart. Saturn is often described as a planet of trials and tribulations and obstacles. And certainly Saturn and Taurus told about the trials and tribulations and obstacles that money was in Vincent van Gogh's life. But what we also get with a Saturn conjunction to Venus in Vincent's chart at 15 degrees Taurus, we, we also need to remember at this point that Venus rules the planets in Taurus. So she rules that Saturn Okay, by transit, she rules, she not only is transiting the Saturn, but she's the ruler of that Saturn at that point. Remember that Venus is named after the Roman goddess of love, beauty, and art. We meet a different side of Saturn, and the different side of Saturn that we meet is longevity. Um, in Petrarch, when he talks about his triumphi, he talks about the difference between fame and time. And each triumphi trumps the previous one. You go from love to chastity to death to fame. That fame is greater than death. That if you're a famous person, that you can outlive your life, that you will be known centuries after you were alive. But even people who are famous, uh, famous in this life, or maybe even famous for a, a few years after their lives, they can be trumped by time. S uh, Saturn is the planet of time in astrology. So Saturn bequeaths, bestows longevity. It gives you the gift of time. So here, Saturn is conjunct Venus, which is the ruler of the ascendant of Starry Night. And so Saturn basically bestows upon that Venus a longevity. It's more than fame. It's a longevity. It could be on the brink of eternity. And Starry Night is indeed Vincent van Gogh's most recognizable and most famous painting. What we also have is that the Taurus ascendant of Starry Night, we have it at 29 degrees Taurus, sextiles Venus at 28 degrees Pisces exalted in Vincent's chart. So Venus also owns the ascendant of the Starry Night horoscope. She brings it to the top of Vincent van Gogh's chart through rulership and through sextile. The painting becomes connected to the destiny of Vincent van Gogh. Finally, we see this lineup of planets in Gemini. You will notice that when you look towards the latter degrees of Gemini, you will see that the ruling planet of Starry Night is Mercury. Mercury is at 27 degrees Gemini. That 27 degrees Gemini is conjunct the North Node in Gemini in Vincent van Gogh's natal chart. And what you also see there, it's almost like an extra, um, uh, uh, it's like an extra recognition. Okay, what you also see in the Starry Night chart 
is the exact conjunction of Mars and the Sun at 29 degrees Gemini. We know that the 29th degree is a very dramatic degree in the horoscope. So we have Vincent van Gogh's ruling planet Mars, Kazemi. It is at the exact same degree as the Sun in Gemini, ruled by Mercury, which then rules and conjoins Vincent van Gogh's North Node in Gemini in the 12th house. What do we have here? What we have here is an amazing work which is produced in an asylum. It's produced in a 12th house atmosphere. It's at a place where Vincent felt serenity and peace at times. And he produces this extraordinary work, which is Starry Night, which we can, thanks to DeGrasse Tyson, draw up a horoscope for and tell this part of Vincent's story. One year later, when Vincent is undergoing his nodal return, the transiting north node is 23 degrees Gemini, and it is exactly conjunct Van Gogh's north node at 22 degrees Gemini. One year later, Vincent Van Gogh dies of a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and he dies during this, this nodal return. Uh, there is release from the struggle and from the suffering and from the sadness of his life, something he always struggled with. What's also interesting is that six months, almost to the day, his brother Teo dies. Um, Teo was with Vincent when he passed. And Teo, at the grief and agony of his brother's death, put all of his energy into Vincent's uh, funeral and then into putting together an exhibition and a catalog for paintings that nobody had wanted, okay? This was Teo's last testament of love to his brother and Teo's last defiance, you know? Um, and so the friends of Vincent that he had made in Paris, the other artists, um, vowed to Teo when he died that they would see this exhibition through and that it would not have been left an incomplete project, that they would see this uh, exhibition through. And the exhibition launches the fame of Vincent van Gogh. It's, it's one of those impossible, tragic, frustrating moments where everyone's like, oh my God, this is like really great art, you know, where the penny drops and everyone sees it and everyone experiences the art of Vincent van Gogh. Teo's widow, uh, Joe, Joe Van Gogh, um, became responsible for the artwork um, and curated it. Uh, events eventually becomes housed uh, in the Netherlands at the Vincent van Gogh Museum, um, which again brings back that cancer rising. Cancer is home and hearth and roots and family. Um, cancer is also your homeland. You know, the, the moon in Sagittarius talked about Vincent wandering and meandering in and out of all these different cultures and, 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 and countries, you know, but what was always there with that cancer rising was the homeland. And Vincent becomes one of the top Dutch artists, the most famous uh, of the Dutch artists, along with Rembrandt, um, of the Netherlands. And he becomes housed here, you know, really fulfilling that cancer rising uh, legacy. In the end, Vincent repays Teo for everything that he did for him. And in a way that neither brother could possibly imagine, the struggles with money, the shame over the money, the, the struggle with mental illness, both brothers die before they even see that become a reality. But what we see is Vincent's story of death and resurrection. Vincent dies, but he is resurrected in this tremendous art of his, which goes out to all corners of the world and testifies, bears witness to Vincent, to his art, to his suffering. And so when you look at a Vincent van Gogh painting, you don't think of his, 
suffering or whatever, what you are struck by is not an illustration or a picture. What you are struck by is vitality of his life force in that canvas, the vitality of his life force in those colors, in those brush strokes, the passion, the suffering, the life, and the immortality. You know, the, the paintings live beyond him, and they are made of him, and they still impact us to this day. I want to share with you, I want to share with you a final quote. Vincent van Gogh once said, when I have a terrible need of, shall I say the word, religion? Then I go out and paint the stars. If you enjoyed what you saw, please press the like button. It helps more than you know. If you could subscribe, that would be wonderful. I've had such a wonderful time visiting with you this week, and I can't wait to get together next time on Christopher Renstrom Astrology.